once again a very warm welcome to all of our attendees this morning. To start off with, we want to remind you about the 28th of July 2022, that is the Plumbing Industry Awards that are happening um, at the Royal Elephant Hotel and Conference Center at 6 p.m. For more information on getting this information to you or maybe registering for the Plumbing Industry Awards, please contact marketing at iopsa.org. Remember, it is going to be a black tie event. So if you are going, please make sure you dress up nice and smart. So the tips to continually prevent COVID-19, and I think we've spoken about this quite often, is to not just prevent COVID-19, but also to prevent other illnesses. So washing your hands regularly, always a good idea. Making sure that if you don't have access to clean soap and water, you can use a alcohol-based hand sanitizer. If you do not have uh, facilities to wash your hands and you do have unwashed hands, please avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth, especially as plumbers, uh, you do touch a lot of surfaces. And if you're going into private homes or to some of your clients where you're unblocking drainage, uh, perhaps installing new plumbing or even trying to do maintenance on older plumbing. Remember, we are working with plumbing and so uh, bacteria, diseases, viruses are always in the vicinity. Adhere to social distancing measures and avoid close contact with people who are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze with a flexed elbow, especially with change of season, getting colder. A lot of us uh, are starting to get those flu-like symptoms back. And then also clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces. This will include all the tools that we are using. So please cross contamination from when we've touched, you know, any type of plumbing that we are working on. And then the tools that we are working on, perhaps we clean the area, we wash our hands, but if we haven't cleaned our tools, the next time we touch our tools, you could have cross-contamination from that as well. So let's move on to our toolbox talk for today. We are looking at scaffolding. Last week, we spoke about ladders and the importance of ensuring we are safe on a ladder. And today we want to take a look at our safety quote or safety thought for the week, which is do what is right, not what is easy. And when it comes to scaffolding, it seems like many want to go the cheaper route or do what is the quickest and the easiest. Now, yes, there are quick solutions. There are easy solutions. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are unsafe, but there are other solutions that uh, take a little bit longer in order to ensure that safety is done properly. And this is where we never, ever want to take any shortcuts. So we're very happy to see and we must commend our plumbers when we are on site uh, or the sites that we have been on with you. I do see a few names here where I've been on site with you and we just must commend you in front of all the other members on how brilliantly you are ensuring that your scaffolding or working at heights plans are being implemented on site. You're not taking any shortcuts with that type of safety. And we do want to say how much we really appreciate that uh, to see that you guys are working safely on site. So let's continue that when it comes to the scaffolding that we are using. Now, scaffolding, <clears throat> sometimes called staging or just scaffold, is a temporary elevated platform and it supports uh, this structure for providing of access to people or even supporting people on that scaffold or even the materials sometimes it's going to support both but it, depending on what we are using the scaffolding for it may need to be built differently now oftentimes you will see scaffolding go up and if you've never built scaffolding before sometimes it looks the same whether we've got people on it, whether we've got materials on it. Perhaps you've even seen scaffolding where people are wearing harnesses and then on other scaffolding, people not wearing harnesses. Well, what's the difference? Why is there a difference? Why is there not one standard? Well, there is one standard, but it depends on, first of all, the type of scaffolding we're using, uh, where the scaffolding is being you know, erected, and then also not just where and what type of scaffolding it's what we are using that scaffolding for. That is also very, very important. So we never want to just feel that all scaffolding has an easy setup section. In other words, you buy some scaffolding, you put it up, and it can be used for anything. That's not how it works. Planning is crucial to the use of all types of scaffolding. So it helps us to do construction. It helps us to do maintenance. It helps us to do repairing of uh, buildings or any other man-made structure. The question though that you are going to ask 
during this toolbox talk is who is building the scaffold? Is it yourself or is it somebody else? So we're going to look at both of these answers. So if you are building the scaffold, we want to ensure that you do it correctly. So let's say you are building the scaffold. There are three questions you're going to ask yourself. First of all, what type of scaffolding uh, do you need? Then what are you going to use that scaffolding for? And then where is that scaffolding going to be staged? Now, after you have selected the type of scaffolding, and you've determined what you are using it for, the where question must be investigated. Because the type of scaffold and determining what it's being used for is pretty simple. You know your scope of work. Perhaps you already know the tools and materials that you're going to be using. You've already selected a team to work on that scaffold. And you found a scaffolding supplier that's going to provide you strong, quick stage scaffolding. So that's pretty simple. You didn't even need to go to site in order to do an inspection for that. But the where question is of utmost importance because where that scaffolding is going to be staged will determine how it's also going to be used, how many people are going to be affected by that scaffold. What is the ground conditions of where that scaffolding is going to be staged? Now, if you are the one installing that scaffold, obviously you've had training in the use, handling, maintenance, dismantling of scaffolding. And perhaps uh, you and your entire team have been appointed as the scaffolding contractor on site uh, because you provide the scaffolding for yourself. But this means that the proper inspection of the ground area where the scaffolding must be placed has to be done. You see, any uh, improper ground is going to affect the scaffold. And then also the weight of the scaffold. So determining you know, how high the scaffold is going to go, where it's going to be tied into if it's not a freestanding scaffold. All of these questions have to go into basically a scaffolding plan. Now, the scaffolding plan is going to outline these three questions with a comprehensive report of how it's going to be done. So the legislation that applies to you specifically if you are going to be installing the scaffold, erecting that scaffolding, first of all, the main one is SANS 1085. So if you've been trained in scaffolding, you will automatically have this legislation downloaded. It will be part of your portfolio as somebody who builds scaffolding. But if you are going to be doing it in a construction site, so the work you're performing is going to be used within the category of construction. Then construction regulation 16 under scaffolding is going to affect you. Very simple regulation. It's a two-part regulation. 16.1 says you basically have to have somebody that's appointed as a scaffolding supervisor, and they are going to supervise the entire work, ensuring that everybody has a competency in building a scaffold. And that includes uh, the scaffolding inspector, as well as the uh, erection and dismantling team. Then you will also fall under construction regulation 10, which is fall protection. Why is that? Well, the definition of fall risk is any potential exposure to falling either from, off, or into, which includes the use of scaffolding. But now we mentioned earlier, you have some scaffolding where you see people wearing harnesses, and then you have sca some scaffolding where you see people not wearing harnesses. Well, why is that? Well, determining the fall risk is important because some types of scaffolding have been set up to eliminate the possibility of falling from, falling off, or falling into. Now, we're not talking about a tripping hazard where you on a scaffold and you fall to the same level. That's not included in this means of fall risk. You see, so falling from something, so from a platform, from a rooftop, where there's no proper barricading. So there are different types of fall protection. And this is outlined in Construction Regulation 10. You will still need to have a fall protection plan because uh, one of the four main areas of fall protection is fall elimination. And that is by ensuring proper, adequate guarding to ensure that nobody accesses an area where there's a potential to fall. So if you've eliminated the possibility for a fall by putting up proper guardrails, then where can you fall off the actual scaffold? Well, you can't. 
And that is why some scaffolding, you don't need to have a harness on. But some scaffolding, you need to actually take away that guard in order to work on a structure. Now, even if the gap between that is very small, there is still a fall risk. There is still a potential. No matter whether that potential is very low, if that potential exists, there's a possibility from falling from or for into, well, then the adequate means of protection is not just fall protection, but also fall arrest. And the fall arrest includes a safety harness connected to a lanyard, which will then also be connected to an anchor point. And this can be done using different methods. There's restrictions, there's uh, fall arrest equipment with double leg lanyards and scaffolding hooks. Um, there's work positioning belts. You know, there's all different means in order to protect the person from the potential fall risk. So that is why sometimes you'll see a scaffolding has a need for harnesses and sometimes a scaffold will not have a need for harnesses. Regardless of the scaffolding that you are using though, please ensure that if you are the one building the scaffold, that it is done according to this legislation. Now the scaffolding team that you are going to appoint will include a scaffolding supervisor, a scaffolding inspector, as well as a scaffolding team. Now the scaffolding team is the one who's actually going to build the scaffold. The scaffolding supervisor and scaffolding inspector cannot be part of the scaffolding team that erects and dismantles the scaffold. Why is that? Well, the supervisor obviously is in the name. They are supervising. They are not working. So a supervisor is checking that it is done correctly. They are not doing it themselves. And if you had to tell somebody, well, you have to do the work and check the work. Well, I can promise you this. Many people, nine times out of 10, will do the work, not check it, and just say it's been done correctly because, well, they did it. So you cannot check your own work. And that same goes for the scaffolding inspector who needs to sign off that scaffolding. So you also can't be part of the scaffolding team that erects and dismantles the scaffold. You are part of the overall team, but not part of the ones who build or dismantle that scaffolding. Now, the scaffolding team that builds uh, the scaffolding or dismantles it or changes it and alters it, this must consist of a minimum of four competent scaffolding erectors. So as a minimum, you will see that you need at least six people in order to ensure your scaffolding is done correctly. So you might ask yourself, is this viable for me? Well, that's why many people hire contractors to build the scaffolding for them. But if you are building it yourself, as the answer is in the question that we've discussed this morning, you are building your own scaffold, then you need to ensure your scaffolding team consists of competent appointed scaffolding supervisor, scaffolding inspector, and four scaffolding erectors and dismantlers. Now, once you've got this information, you know what scaffolding you need, you know where that scaffolding is going to be erected. You also know what work you are going to perform on it. You now do the planning of the stages. <clears throat> that is the setup, the use, the inspection, and the dismantling of that entire scaffold. And so the entire team gets together to discuss how this is going to be done. And this is all put into a scaffolding plan. You see, you need to plan the setup. You need to plan how it's supposed to be used. You also need to plan for the inspections that need to be done and then the dismantling of that scaffold. Now, oftentimes on a construction site, you will have a mobile scaffold. Now, a mobile scaffold obviously has wheels and it can be moved around. So it's not going to be dismantled and moved. It can just be moved from one section to another on level ground using caster wheels. Then that's not necessarily falling under the dismantling aspect of it. But if any alteration was done, so anything was changed on that scaffold, well, then it needs to be reinspected. But a lot of scaffolding just has normal base jacks or base plates. So it's a freestanding scaffold, but it's stationed and a particular place. It doesn't have caster wheels on to be mobile or moved around. Then if you do need to move it, then you have to dismantle it, reset it up, say how it's going to be used, re-inspect it. All right, so you need to follow that continuous cycle 
all the time. And this again, all has to be in your scaffolding plan. So let's take a look at uh, two different types of scaffolds here. It might also be a quick stage scaffold. Both of these pictures could represent quick stage scaffolding. On the one side, you've got a freestanding scaffold. You can have this as freestanding with base jacks or you can have it freestanding mobile. Either way, you are going to ensure that they have all of the following. So starting from the top, you must ensure that it all has tow boards. In both of the pictures, you will see the tow board. This is a tow board or a kick plate. The reason for this is any tools or materials that are being placed onto the scaffold must not be allowed to fall off. If your materials or equipment that you are using is going to be higher than the tow board, now at a minimum, this is generally at 150 millimeters. All right, so 15 centimeters is where they put this tow board. But if you have, let's say, bricks or more equipment that is going to be stacked higher than that, well, then you have to have a higher tow board or a higher kick plate, especially when it's a stack on top of a stack. So we're not talking about one large component that cannot fall between the knee rail and the tow board because that space is too short. Again, do you know what that space is? What is the length, the size, the height of the tools and equipment you are using? If it is a having, having a potential rather to fall through that little gap between the knee rail and the tow board, well then most of the time, and this is going to be for any type of work you're performing, because the work you're performing doesn't necessarily dictate this. It's the tools and equipment you are using on site that will dictate this. There's the potential for it to fall through that gap. You're going to have to have screens up or a higher tow board in order to prevent something from falling. Now on the left-hand side of the picture, you've got freestanding scaffolding. And on the right-hand side of the scaffolding uh, picture, you've got a scaffolding that's been tied in. So you can see that there's not a full guardrail or knee rail on the right-hand side. It's actually been tied into the structure. And so that will mean that you have to have through tires or adequate bracing guards, any type of tires into the actual structure, which cannot be moved very easily. And this is to ensure the strength of that scaffold. Now, moving down, we've got uh, hook on boards or the platform. It can either be steel or sometimes wood, but you will notice in both of these pictures, it is a fully decked working platform. In other words, there are no gaps between the platform boards. It is fully decked so that there's no potential to fall through them. On the left-hand side, <clears throat> you will also see a trap door. Now, this is potentially what you could have on the picture on the right-hand side. You might have a trap door with a ladder, but oftentimes the picture on the right-hand side types of scaffolding will include a staircase. And these staircases make for easier uh, walking up and walking down of the scaffold. Uh, and generally speaking, we will include staircases when we build this type of scaffold because it is just a lot safer and also a lot stronger. And it doesn't necessarily uh, eliminate a fall altogether from platform to platform, but it does make it a lot safer for employees to walk and um, descend that scaffolding. On the left-hand side in that freestanding scaffold, you will notice that you have a hook on access ladder. That ladder will protrude through the uh, trap door. And once you go through it, you need to close the trap door. If you don't close it, well, then there's a potential for somebody to fall through it. Then you're going to have, obviously, your, your ledges and your standards and all your connectors, your scaffolding tube with brace pipes. You're going to have your swivel couplers, base checks, all of those uh, different components in order to make up the entire scaffold. Because there are so many different components, you need to have a register and checklist, as well as inspection forms, for each type of scaffolding component. Please remember that when you are building the scaffold, your register and checklist, your register will include all the parts of your scaffold. How many ladders, how many trapdoors, how many hook on boards, how many connectors, how many swivel couplers, how many base jacks. You need to have all of that, including the inspection registers for each of them to ensure that each part of your scaffold is safe. Now, continuing with scaffolding safely, safety should start from the beginning, right at planning stages. So your scaffolding plan and your full protection plan should also outline how the scaffolding must be used by the people working on it or the materials being stacked on it 
And don't forget about your weight categories. You know, what is the weight of the equipment, the weight of the employees, your combined total weight? Is your scaffolding set up and braced correctly to allow for that type of weight? So if you are building the scaffold and you're building it with the intent for somebody else to use it, you need to get that information. It needs to be part of that scope of work. Then what and where are acceptable anchor points? If you do need to have full arrest systems on the scaffold, where are you allowed to hook up while you are working on the scaffold? Included in that scaffolding plan is your plan, as we mentioned, for the inspection. This must happen every seven days by an appointed, competent scaffolding inspector. Every seven days after any alterations, after any inclement weather, as well as after an incident or accident. Now, what if the answer to your question, who is building the scaffold, is someone else? I'm the plumber on site. I'm not building my own scaffolding. As a plumber, I've got another contractor coming out to build my scaffold. Does this mean you are off the hook? No. Even though you are not planning the build, you are not planning for inspecting the ground or managing the scaffold, you still need to check whether it is safe for you to use it. So here are a few things that you must check. Even though it's visually done, Perhaps you're not going to have an actual register or checklist on site. Some sites will require you to have a register or checklist. And again, if you need information on this, please reach out to us. We've got these checklists already designed for you. You need to take a look at the safe to use tag. Now, as we mentioned earlier, and I'm just going to go one uh, page back or one slide back. Notice when inspections must be done. Every seven days. So on the first day, it's inspected. And then every seven days thereafter, if it has been altered in any way, if any changes have been made to that scaffold, it needs to be re-inspected. If there's been any inclement weather, then it needs to be re-inspected. If there's been an incident or an accident on that scaffold, it needs to be re-inspected. So now you get a safety use tag. It's always going to be signed by the scaffolding inspector who's appointed and competent to sign it off. And you will notice the date that he signs it off as well as your different inspection dates on the back of the safety use tag. Now, if you see that the first time he built the scaffold and inspected it was on the 1st of May, 2022, well, then you would know every seven days thereafter on a weekly basis, the scaffold needs to be inspected. But what if you had rain last night? Do you get to work this morning? You notice the entire site is wet from the rain yesterday, but the scaffolding was inspected on Friday last week. It's still within your seven-day period, but remember, it has to be inspected after inclement weather. If today's date is not on that scaffold, is it safe to use? No, because according to SANS 1085, it has to be inspected after the rain occurred, as that is inclement weather. Then, what should a working platform consist of? Well, a fully decked boarded platform. It must have tow boards, it must have a knee rail, it must have a handrail. If any of these parts are missing, is it safe for you to use, even though the safe to use tag is on? No. If you have any doubt, you need to get the scaffolding inspector out there to check whether it is safe. Remember, we do not want you to be liable, even though you might not be at fault. But remember, if you fall off that scaffold, you are the one that gets injured, not the scaffolding inspector. So don't take the safe to use green tag as a legally binding contract between you and that scaffolding inspector. Know what a scaffolding should consist of. Do you know whether you need to use a harness on that scaffold? Do you know where you are going to be placing your tools and if there's a potential for it to fall? And then a very big one, if you are not part of that scaffolding team, you are never, ever allowed to alter, remove, or change the scaffold in any way. Never think it's just quickly, I need to remove this and put it back on. It's not going to change anything. You should never, ever, ever do that because it could affect the overall safety of that scaffold. Now, just for the next minute, I want to remind you of something extremely important. 
especially with that answer to the question, are you building your own scaffold? No, someone else is building it. So you are a plumber, you arrange someone else to build a scaffolding for you. They are referred to as a mandatory. This is defined as someone who is an agent, a principal contractor, a contractor for work or service provider appointed by the client. Now, the client is the person who pays for that service and appoints that person. So if you are the contractor on site and you appoint a scaffolding company to build that scaffold for you, you essentially become a client to that scaffolding contract and they become your mandatory. They must ensure that they have a copy of the client specifications, a scaffolding plan, a full protection plan, a full rescue plan, a full risk assessment, legal appointments and competency certificates of everybody in that scaffolding team, their own inspections, registers, checklists, and a signed mandatory 37.2 agreement between yourself as well as them. So a full safety file. Because if you need to have somebody set up a scaffolding for you, and anything goes wrong and you do not have a mandatory agreement between you, you as the client are 100% liable for any injury or damage that scaffolding uh, um, causes. The reason for that is if you don't have a mandatory in place, then you have not agreed to the terms and conditions of your appointment. And if you've paid for that scaffold, you essentially are saying that they are part of your employees because you do not have a mandatory 37.2 agreement. They don't have their own safety file. They're falling under your file. If that happens, please remember, you are liable. So let's end off with saying thank you very much once again for joining us for the Scaffolding Toolbox Talk. If you have scaffolding on site, please do what is right and not what is easy. Next week, we're going to have a look at ceilings, Many plumbers are working in ceilings. There are dangers. Obviously, we're accessing these ceilings with ladders. So we're going to incorporate some reminders from ladders that we had last week. But let us take a look next week at what are we doing inside the ceiling to ensure that we are safe. Thank you very much once again for joining us. Uh, we look forward to chatting to many of you throughout the week. And don't forget about the Prime course. If you haven't registered yet, please go ahead and register. The first module is already ready there for you uh, on that link. Just once again, a reminder of our safety thought for this week. Please do what is right, not what is easy, especially when it comes to our lives working on uh, hearts. Thanks.